What do you think people who are not Christians think Christians believe? I remember when I was in college, I was a senior and uh, getting ready to graduate and was going to seminary. And I, I did not major in religion or anything like that. So I, I was in kind of the final class of my major. And there was a, a girl in my, my class who knew I was going into ministry, but she was not a Christian. And she just asked me sheepishly one time, almost kind of embarrassed. She said, so does this mean that you can't get married? And I was like, no, I'm not going to be a Catholic priest. Nothing against it. Just not my call. But that was her only experience with church or Christianity. And she literally had no idea that Protestant pastors could marry. Good morning. My name is Carter McInnes. I am husband to the wonderful, amazing Emily McInnes, who I am married to. And I'm really grateful for that. And also get to be lead pastor here. Really grateful that you are here. If you're joining us online, thanks for welcoming us into your home or wherever you're at. And if you're uh, here in the room, it's so good to see so many of you each and every week. If you are brand new here today, really honored that you came. We're kicking off a series today. And if you didn't connect to the new here booth afterwards, would love for you to stop by there so we can get connected with you and, and get you plugged into what's going on here at Mountaintop. We're beginning this new series today, What Do Christians Believe Really? Because people think in order to be a Christian, people who are not Christians think you have to believe all sorts of things. And this is particularly uh, confusing depending on which brand of Christianity you have had experience with or has influenced you. For instance, for instance, some Christians believe very differently about baptism. Some believe you have to be baptized a certain way with a certain amount of water. Some believe you have to be baptized in their church for it to count. Some believe that only certain people can do the baptism. Some Christians believe very differently about the sacraments. The Roman Catholic Church says there are seven. Most Protestant mainline churches says there are two. Non-denominational churches are like, what's a sacrament? Uh, I mean, right? <laughs> You're like, it's most Protestants say communion and baptism, and even within that, some churches believe that only certain people can preside over communion. Some churches believe very differently about women. Some believe that they can teach, that they can preach, that they can be in leadership, and some say that they can't. Some Christians believe very differently about church clothes. Right? And some say you got to wear your Sunday best in order to come to church because you're coming to God's house. And others say come as you are. Wear whatever you want to. If you got a baseball game this afternoon, just wear your uniform. Some Christians believe very differently about traditional and contemporary worship. Some say they want, they want organs, the pipes, the piano, the hymns, the stained glass. And some say the louder and the brighter and the more fog, the better. And some do like this acoustic, ancient worship thing. Some Christians believe very differently about children. Some believe that they should sit in the service and be still and listen to the preacher. Some churches bring them in for just a little bit, like a third. They're the music. And then they ship them off to somewhere else in the building or somewhere else. Some create environments for children just for the whole hour. Some build big buildings just for children. Some churches believe very differently about seminary. Some churches say that every pastor should have to go to seminary. You need the education. Some Christians and some churches say seminary ruins pastors, makes them too progressive, makes them too academic. Some Christians believe very differently about predestination and free will. Some say that God has ordained and ordered everything that has ever happened, even who will go to heaven and who will go to hell. And some say that we have free will completely, that you might could even surprise God, and some Christians believe something in between. Some Christians believe very differently about speaking in tongues. Some Christians and some churches would say that it is necessary evidence for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. While others would say, well, it's not the sign, but it is a sign, and others would say that it's not even a thing anymore, and not only you couldn't do it, you shouldn't do it, and some people, it scares the daylights out of them. 
Some Christians believe very differently about alcohol. Some churches teach that you should be a teetotaler. teetotaler and other churches serve real wine at communion. I didn't see that one coming. Yeah. Welcome to the SEC where it just means more. Uh, <clears throat> tailgating in church, yeah. All right. So, um, so, dancing. Some churches, they dance in the aisles. Some of you might have even grew up in that. Some churches say, you should not dance. Most Christians I know can't dance. Uh, <laughs> Bible translation, well, we're almost done, but this is all the difference. Bible translation, some churches say it's King James or nothing. And some churches say, well, you can teach from the NIV or the NRSV or the NRIV. Some churches say you should never preach from the message. Some Christians actually read and some churches in, the, in Latin, which was the first translation of the Hebrew and Greek. And the last one is this. Some churches believe, this is so silly, believe very differently about coffee. Like you have probably been to a church that had a sign on the door that said no food or drinks in the sanctuary. And some churches make coffee and invite you to bring it in. I gotta tell you, just a couple of weeks ago, I was at an event and it was kind of one of those events where they had like coffee. And it was kind of like the coffee that is at like where you get your oil changed. You know, they have like a coffee pot. It's not the best coffee. It was kind of like that. It just kind of had this coffee pot kind of stale in the corner. And I walked by these two ladies and they had gotten the coffee and I just couldn't help. I overheard, I didn't mean to. It just sort of came out of me. And the lady, you know, looks at the other lady and she was like, um, she's like, eh, it's okay. And then she looked to her friend and she said, you know what's the worst coffee? Church coffee. And I, I could, I, it just came out of me as a Holy Spirit. I was like, well, you need to come to my church. <laughs> We got great coffee. You need to change churches. So um, <laughs> those are just realities in the church world. Those are the things we get in church fights over. Those are the reasons we have church splits. Those are the differences for why we have different denominations. It can leave people pretty confused. Which version of Christianity is the right version? Or, as we're talking about in this series, what do Christians believe really? Because we seem like we're not sure what we believe about all those things. That those are different. And what I mean is, what are the non-negotiables? What are the foundational principles, our core doctrines, our primary issues? And the reason I think this is problematic is I think guys like me, in positions like mine, frankly, have not done a good job of teaching congregations what our core issues are. And the reason this is such a big deal is that non-believers often have perceptions about what Christians believe because of the way Christians have presented Christianity. Those things that we talked about are all the things we fight about inside the church. But non-Christians have even more thoughts about what they think we believe or what they think they will have to believe in order to become a Christian. And that's why they're, like non-Christians think when, if they're gonna become a Christian, they gotta think a certain way about music, that if they become a Christian, they can't listen to Taylor Swift or rap or heavy metal. Or when I was growing up, if you played the Ozzy Osbourne record backwards, it was a message from Satan. <laughs> Come on, we taught that. Or non-Christians think if they become a Christian, they have to think a certain way about politics, that they'll have to believe that one or this candidate or that candidate is the Antichrist. If, you know, they'll, they'll, they think that if you will be taught that if you have to conscience, you'll vote Republican, or if you have a soul, you'll vote Democrat. That if they become a Christian, they'll have to think about all the things they're against. They'll have to be against things. They'll have to be against public schools, maybe against private schools, against Hollywood, against mainstream media, against Big Pharma. Because what they see from the church is that we have positioned ourselves as judge and jury of the world. They think they'll have to think a certain way about America. That America is a chosen nation. They think they'll have to become a Christian nationalist in order to become a Christian. And they're thinking about being the Christian, but they're not sure about the nationalist. And you think, oh, come on, come on, is that so much? 
But you know, you have that friend's aunt that you met one time that you became Facebook friends with, and she's a Christian, and that's what she says Christians do. And they think if they become a Christian, they have to join a cult called Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and they may like Popeye's better, and they just may not want to do that. And by the looks of some of those and some of the ways that Christians like me, like you, the churches, have presented Christianity. They have looked at those and said, no thanks. And if you're a skeptic, it is most likely the things you think you have to believe in order to become a Christian that have kept you from even considering becoming one. But I want to tell you that you don't have to believe any of those things to become a Christian. Christians all across the globe disagree about those things. So in this series, I want to talk about what unites us, what binds us, what we all agree on, and what are uniquely Christian beliefs. What are uniquely Christian beliefs? And if you're not a person of faith, I want to tell you something. I think you want to believe these things. I think you're going to want to. And this is important for believers too. Because Christians are often confused about what Christians believe, really. And we can get bent out of shape or sidetracked in our faith because we get stuck on secondary issues that aren't really our issues. And, they're, and sometimes they're not even what we really believe. What we really believe is beautiful. And here's the most important thing. What we believe is good news for everybody. So what we're going to use as the framework for this series, for these foundational beliefs, is something that unites all Christians, and it has been around for a long time. It is called the Apostles' Creed. You heard that in kind of the video before the message. And uh, if you don't know the Apostles' Creed or you've never heard it or you just want a kind of reminder of it, something to keep with you, there's these little cards when you leave outside, uh, leave each door, and on the back of it is the Apostles' Creed. And you might have grown up saying it, or maybe it's completely new to you. I did not grow up saving it, uh, saying it. I served in churches that said it. Uh, we don't necessarily say the creed here. It's not part of our strategy for Sunday mornings. But that doesn't mean that we don't believe it. The creed is something that unites all Christians. And I'm going to make a bold claim. Every church you drove by this morning agrees on it. It, 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 is, a th it is core doctrines. The creed is old. Most likely, this is crazy, most likely predating the canon of the Bible. Meaning that it is older than the, when the books of the New Testament were even put together. In the first few centuries, when there were a lot of kind of like, there's a lot of stuff going on about what, what does it mean to be Christian? What does it mean to follow this Jesus guy? What does it mean to believe in this resurrected king? And tradition says that maybe even each of the apostles had a, had a, a part in putting the creed together. That's why we call it the Apostles' Creed. And in those first few centuries, before the, the New Testament was put together, they put together this creed to clarify what Christians believe really. And we're, we're going to break it up into five sections over the next five weeks about what we believe about the Creator, the Christ, the resurrection, the church, and the kingdom. And we're going to kick things off today with the first couple of lines of the creed and kind of dig into some scripture. The first couple of lines, you heard it on the video, says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, or creator of heaven and earth. And so today we're going to talk about what does it mean that we are a people who believes in the creator? Who is this creator? Why does it matter? Why is it important for us? Now then that creed phrase, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Almighty is a big word, isn't it? It's a big word. What do we believe? That we believe in this almighty God. We believe in a big God, the creator of the Bible. And our, our belief is rooted in the very first words of the Bible. In fact, the first book of the Bible, if you want to look in your Bibles, we're going to be on like page one, page one. Genesis 1, 1, the very first lines of the Bible. The reason that the book is called Genesis is that 
that's in Hebrew, that's the first word. Genesis just means beginning. The first word of the Bible, if you're reading that in Hebrew, just says Genesis. So if you don't have a Bible in the room and you want to take one, we'd love to give you a free copy. There's some bookshelves when you leave. This is why we believe in a creator God, because the very first words of the Bible tell us the story of this creator and how he made the world, how he made us, why he made us. This is what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. There is a design. I mean, the first few lines of the Bible says that there is a design to creation. There is, there is a creator. Without a creator, everything is formless and empty. But Genesis 1 tells us that there is an architect behind it. There is, there is a designer bringing order to the chaos. In the ancient world, waters were chaotic. And if you could just ever think about it, if you've ever been on the open seas and how unpredictable the waves were, imagine in the ancient world how that felt. They, were, they, they just, they said chaos. This is about an architect, a designer, a creator who brings order to that chaos, who takes what was formless and empty and brings it into order. And so right from the very first two sentences in the Bible, it says that what we believe about our creator God is that he brings order to the chaos. He brings form to what is formless and empty. So without the creator, my life is formless and empty. Without the creator, your life is formless and empty. Our marriages are formless and empty. Our careers are formless and empty. Our families, our relationships are formless and empty. Without this creator God in our lives, there is a formlessness and an emptiness in our lives. But Genesis says there is a plan. It doesn't have to be formless. It doesn't have to be chaotic. And this isn't an accident. And you weren't an accident. There is an architect behind your life. There is a creator behind your life. You are not some cosmic happenstance. God made you with purpose. And God created you and me with a special purpose. Humans, we're going to see at the end of Genesis, are the pinnacle of its creation. They're the pinnacle of creation. Now, I'm not going to read through all of Genesis, okay, but I just kind of want to kind of recap what, gen, what the, the days of creation, these six kind of orderly accounts of creation, uh, the six days, and what happens and what God calls it to lead up to finally the creation of humanity. This is what it says. On day one, there's light, evening, and morning. And God calls it what? You're going to see this over again. He calls it good. He calls it good. And I hope you'll read this at home. That's why we want to give you a Bible if you don't have one. If you're watching at home, I hope you'll read it. I hope you'll read Genesis 1 this week. God calls it good. Day 1, there's light. There's evening. There's morning. There's, so there's like this darkness period. There's light period. And then the next day it says he separates the water from the sky. So day 1, like the, the spirit is still hovering over this watery mass. But then he separates the sky from the water. So now there's an atmosphere and God calls it good. Day three, the land, seas, and plants are created. So God takes that water and he begins to separate them, spread them out, gather them together. And there's seas and there's oceans. And now there's continents coming up and there's plants coming up. And he calls it good. And this is one of the wildest things about the creation story to me. Day four, he makes sun, moon, and stars. He calls them good. All right. How do you know what a day is? The sun. It's the only way that we know how to mark a day, right? The sun. It's how the earth rotates, right, to get some parts of the earth the sun, and then how the earth for a year goes around orbits around the sun. So our days, our calendar, our years are marked by the sun. That's how we understand what a 24-hour day is, and there have been three days without a sun, is it perhaps possible that days to God are a little different than ours? So this isn't necessarily about, you know, were they 24-hour days? I don't know. What I know is that our 24-hour days weren't even created to day four. 
Like, so I don't know. I don't know. It's just not the point of the story. We're going to talk more about that. It's just wild to me to think about. Like, that light was created without the sun because we think the sun is like the source of light. Right? That's why ancient civilizations worshiped the sun, but God is the source of light. We see it at the end of the story in Revelation. There is no sun. God is the light. Just some interesting little thing. Day five. Fish and birds, and God calls them good. In day six, animals and insects. I've got some conversation about this when I get to heaven, but anyway, God says they're good. I'm like, can we talk about that? Like, but God looks at it all, and it's all good. So this is so important, and it's what we believe, and we got to understand this. This is so important. It's so foundational. Creation was good. It was good. Not bad. The world was made to be good, to display God's glory. And for Christians, this is so central. God had good plans for this world and still does. I mean, it just drives me nuts when I, when I hear Christians talk about, like, the world, the world. Everything's wrong with the world. The world's, you know. And God's like, hey, 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 hey. It was good. I still have good plans for it. I'm trying to make it good. Would you help me make it good? It's not all it's meant to be right now. But he's not done with me yet. And he's not done with you yet. And he's not done with creation yet. And then listen to the best part. He makes all those things. He makes all those things. And then at the end of day six, it says, So God created mankind. In his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Can I teach you something a little ancient today? The early church fathers and mothers, they had a, they had a phrase for this in the Latin, which is what the, the Bible that they would have read and maybe even the language they would have spoke. They had a, they had a phrase for this. It's a really beautiful phrase. It was called the imago Dei. You can probably figure that out. It's the image of the deity. The image of God. That, that is so critical. This is fundamental to how we understand humanity and how we view humanity. We believe in a maker of heaven and earth who baked into the DNA of every single human his own image. You have never looked into the eyes of someone who did not possess the Imago Dei, ever. This means we see this image in every human. We see this Imago Dei in every human. Every human who disagrees with us. Every human who cheers for a different team than us. Every human who doesn't like us, who doesn't look like us, who doesn't think like us. And maybe we need reminding every four years, who doesn't vote like us. We see a world, Christians, unique to us, of eight billion image bearers and this changes how we view ourselves because sometimes the hardest person for us to see the imago day in is the person looking back in the mirror because we know all the stuff we've done and we see the image of our mistakes and our past and our sin but we believe in a creator God, the Father Almighty, who thinks you look just like your daddy, just like your heavenly father. And this is so important because we need to know our creator to know what we're created for. If we don't know our creator and we don't know the design, then we'll go off on a tangent. We'll do something different. We'll spend the rest of our lives doing something for which we were not created, going in the wrong direction, thinking we know better. Um, it's not 
uh, difficult to see when you pull up on campus. If you're watching online, you don't know this. You know, we got a huge construction project going on. It's been going on for 11 months. We got a couple of months and we're done. And it's starting to take shape now. And just this week, uh, there was something that I was like, was that right? Like, is that right? I mean, is that the way? I mean, it's, it's a big project. There's so many details. And I was like, I don't know. Does that, does that look right? And I, you know, I talked to our facilities team and like, yeah, I don't know either. So I, I fire off an email to our architects and our builders like, hey, we were just looking at something and we were just unsure and help me understand, is this, is this right? Is it done right? I thought it was going to be this. And they sent back pictures of the finished product and they sent back plans of the design. And when it's done, it's going to look great. And this is why I responded to them, to our architect. I trust you. I trust you. You know what you're doing. I trust you. And we need to know our creator to know what we're created for. You got to know the architect behind your life so that when you're like, yeah, this doesn't feel right, doesn't look right, and then you look up the plans, you see the finished product, and you say, okay, I don't get it now. Doesn't quite look right. I trust you. God gives the first humans then a calling right at the end. And we looked at this last week. If you're brand new, we just finished up a series on Noah, and we see this repeated in the Noah story. This is what it says. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish. So like we are meant to rule. Like we've got a purpose on earth, the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and every living creature that moves along the ground. God blesses them, gives them dominion over the earth and tells them that they are part of the co-creating to add to the world that he has made. You and I are meant to add to the world, to fill this world, to give back to it. And this is the best part. When God makes all this stuff and he finishes with humans and he gives humans the role for which they were created, something changes. Creation is no longer good. It's even better. God saw all that he had made. What was it saying? It was very good. It was very good. And there was evening and there was morning. The sixth day. It was very good. Creation was very good. We created we're created to be very good, and this is why this matters. We need to know who made the world to know what to make of the world. We need to know who made the world. We need to know this story to know what to make of the world. Because have you ever looked at the news? Have you ever opened Twitter? Have you ever opened whatever social media you're on? Have you ever seen an article? Have you ever talked to a friend? Have you ever heard a story and said, man, it's hard to know what to make of the world these days? And we need to know who made the world to know exactly what to make of the world, to know that there is a plan for a greater story. And sometimes we misunderstand the plan and in turn miss the greater story. The plan is that there is a mastermind behind it, there is a creator behind it, and Christians agree on this. What Genesis does not say is how God did it. It says that God did it. And come on. I'm going to try not to end up on the internet here. <clears throat> so when Christians get all up in arms and in online arguments and in school board meetings about evolution, Genesis does not say how God did it. It teaches God's word teaches that God did it. That there was a mastermind behind it. There is a creator. And however God did it is his prerogative. I was not there and neither were you. And I've got a sneaking suspicion it happened in a way that none of us could predict and none of us have ever thought of. But here's what I know. The only thing that matters for me is the who, not the how. 
We need to know who made the world in order to know what to make of the world. We believe, what it teaches is that there is a creator, a designer, an architect who brought order to chaos. And if that's true, he can bring order to my chaotic life. And I don't care how he does it. I just want the who to do it. And this is so important for what Christians believe really. Without understanding our creator, the next part won't make much sense. You won't understand God's redemption plan for the world he created. Because the creation story and the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, the rest of the Old Testament, is is like that part at the beginning of Star Wars. Okay? This is one of the reasons I love Star Wars. And if you're not a Star Wars nerd, it's okay. I was a Star Wars nerd growing up. It It was the big thing when I was a kid. But the thing I love about Star Wars, if you miss this part of the movie and then you enter into the story, there are characters you don't know and a plot line you do not understand. And the reason it is important for us to know the creator and the creation story and God's God's background story of his work in his people, Israel, It's a little bit like this, because when we read it, if not, we'll pick up and open up the New Testament, and there will be characters we don't know and a plot line we don't understand. And the creation story, the creator God and his people, they give the backdrop to that. It it is a backdrop of a world God created and how it all went wrong in his plan to redeem the world that he created to make it good again. And we need to know. Who made the world to know what to make of this world? Because the next part of the creed has nothing to do with a lot of the Old Testament stories that are sometimes hard to understand. The next part of the story, the next part of the creed, is how this creator God sent his one and only son to redeem this world that had gotten broken. To make good creation that had gone bad and most importantly to restore the imago day in you and me that had gotten distorted thousands of years after genesis decades after jesus rose from the dead The Apostle Paul wrote this about Jesus. For from him, like all those things you read in Genesis 1, it came from him. It's talking about Jesus. And through him, you want to get back to that creator God? You do it through him. And for him, it was all made for him. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. When we know Jesus, we can know the creator and why we were created in the first place. We can begin to get a glimpse of the very goodness God made this crazy world for in the first place. We can get a taste of the Imago Day that our sin and past has twisted. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and maker of me, and maker of you. And you have to come back next week to hear about what we believe about the Christ and why what we believe about this man named Jesus makes all the difference. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, the Father Almighty, our Maker, our creator, our sustainer. 
thank you for making us in your image, for this world you have given us. God, would you help us? Would you help us to keep the main thing the main thing? Would you remind us when the world looks so bad that you made it good? Would you remind us that when the person in the mirror looking back at us looks so broken, you made us to look like you? When you remind us that when our life is chaotic and formless and empty, that you can bring order and you can bring purpose. Thank you for making us. Would you help continue to make us what you want us to be? In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close with a song that uh, we haven't done in a minute. And I said we don't necessarily say the creed here, but sometimes we sing this song. It's a song that kind of sings the creed in a modern way. So I hope you'll embrace it. If you want to come down and pray, this place is always open today if you want to come down front and pray. Let's stand.